every what was more nerve wracking, pitching the All Star game or opening day? Because I know you didn't like opening. I day hated somewhere. opening day. Um, <laughs> pitching opening day is more nerve wracking. Well, it has been 42 long years since we had the All Star game here at Dodgers Stadium. Major League Baseball finally answered the Dodgers' wishes, and they gave the game. Uh, the Midsummer Classic here for Dodger Stadium in 2022. All the great stars, they're going to be gathering here three weeks from tomorrow. Major League Baseball has produced a video as we take a look up on the screen right now what we can expect, all the festivities and events surrounding the game. This July, Major League Baseball's All-Star Week comes to the entertainment capital of the world. A leading cast of stars will shine under the brightest of lights. This kid is amazing. When the game's best come to Hollywood. The Midsummer Classic is upon us. Trying to miss strike three. Oh, yes, he did. The stage is set for an epic showcase of style. You're decked out, man. You're decked. Skill. He got it! What a play! This dude is unbelievable. Sizzle. You could not take your eyes off him. And speed. The speed of like any other. Um, it's unbelievable. And out. The All-Star Party comes to L.A. Yeah, 42 years later, the All-Star Game is finally coming back here to Los Angeles. The winning pitcher in that game, by the way, was a Dodger. It was Jerry Royce getting the win in the 1980 All-Star Game. Uh, joining us right now is a man who was an All-Star just last season for the second time in his career, and earlier this year made his 100th career start, and when he did so, he set a Major League record. Fewest losses by any pitcher in history through their first 100 starts of their career. Also, the second best winning percentage, fourth best ERA through their first 100 starts. Let's welcome Walker Bueller. Or you should introduce the next guy since you saw this left-hander a lot up close and in person. Well, uh, 1981 was a very special year for him. Uh, it was even more special for me when I was a teammate of his in Double A. Used to get a chance to commute to the ballpark in Double A with him. Ducky LeJohn was our manager in Double A, and when Fernando got called up and got on his run, pitched in the All-Star game and all of his starts, Ducky LeJohn, our manager, would actually bring a TV into our dugout during our game so we could watch our teammate pitch in the big leagues, and it really encouraged us that we could make it. A guy that is uh, very, very special, special to the community, special to the stadium and this organization, a uh, good friend of mine and a great, great pitcher, Fernando Valenzuela. <laughs> well, last and certainly not least, really is a man who doesn't need an introduction. He's in the Baseball Hall of Fame. He's been broadcasting Dodger games since 1959. And this year, his 64th and final season as the Spanish voice of the Los Angeles Dodgers. Say hello to Jaime Harin. You're up, John. All right. Well, since we were just talking about the All-Star game, Walker, I want to start with you. I know you've been an All-Star the last two times that they actually had an All-Star game. Got to pitch in the game in 2019. What is that experience like for any pitcher? Oral said it was a little nerve-wracking. Did you find it to be the same experience yourself? Um, yeah, the, the All-Star game for me was uh, we had played in the World Series in 2018. Sorry, it's all right. Uh, no, we had played in the World Series in 2018, and, and to be honest with you, I was I was 
way more nervous at the All-Star Game in, in 2019 than, than that game. So um, obviously the, one of the coolest honors you can get in our game, but um, it's extremely nerve-wracking for me. How about for you, Fernando? All-Star Game experience? Uh, my first one was in um, 1981. Uh, that's, uh, I think, for the Dyers was a big year. Won the World Series in that year, and uh, and my personal numbers were, was a uh, good experience in Cleveland for the All Star Game. How about for you, Jaime? You called a bunch of All Star Games in your brilliant career. What is it like for a broadcaster? This is going to be my 25th All Star Game. Uh, I am looking forward to that. As you know, this is going to be my last year with the Dodgers, and. Uh, I don't know how to react to that. Um, it's tough to leave something that you have been doing for 64 consecutive years. But at the same time, I think it's time for me to change priorities, to pay more time to my family, to my two sons, work on the foundation that we have that carries the, the Blanca Harin and the Jaime Harin Foundation and do some, some humanitarian work. So it has been a great ride for me. And, and to be among the, the all-stars, it's, it's fantastic. The feeling that you have, is, it's great. Uh, the words come more fluidly if you're doing a thing like that. How many World Series did you do, honey? Uh, this coming will be my 30th World Series. Wow. I have done 24 uh, no-hitters, and I have done three uh, perfectos. Three perfect games. Uh, Hanley Ramirez made a mistake, a mirror in the shortstop, that otherwise Kershaw would have done a perfect game. That would have given me the fourth. Nobody in the history of the game has done more than three perfect games. I was so close and I was praying. <laughs> have you did you call him? Did you talk to him? Uh, yeah. <laughs> No, I never, I didn't get there to talk to him. But I was very close to, to call my fourth perfect game. That would have been really, really great. Fernando, do you remember the last out in your no-hitter? It's right here. I know, do you remember? <laughs> close. Ground ball to who? Uh, Pedro Guerrero was, uh, yep. he, he tried so hard because he's, I, I know he's he's one to hit the ball so hard. So so I say, well, if I keep the ball in, inside in the hands, if he can hit it hard, it's going to be foul ball. And so that's that's the reason I tried to pitch inside. And so that was a cutter right in the hands and then hit it back to the to the second baseman for the for the double play, no hitter. That was you know I was very fortunate to be with Fernando since he arrived to the Major Leagues in September 1980. I was with him every day, even at the White House. And the only game that I missed calling was the, he's not here. Yeah, I missed that game because I was in a hospital in Vero Beach, Florida. I, I couldn't do it and, uh, and I missed, it's unbelievable. I was with him everywhere, but his best night, I wasn't with him. And if I know the story correctly, Fernando, you told the guys in your clubhouse that you were going to throw a no-hitter that night because Dave Stewart, your former teammate, had just thrown one that same night. Yeah, it's coming in the book. You know. <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah, that was uh, a lot of people was watching the game in uh, Toronto. I think uh, Dave Stewart pitching the game for the uh, athletics and... They, they. Uh, when I was walking to the, to the bullpen to warm up for the ready for the game, that's when, they, they told me this. They, they swear got no hitter, and I say, okay, you guys watching one on TV now, gonna watch one on live. <laughs> and that's happened. <laughs> it actually time. happened. Incredible stuff. So, well, this. This guy right here to my left certainly has no-hit stuff, and I imagine before it's all said and done, he's going to have a good chance to, to flirt with a couple of no-hitters. But I want to talk a little bit about health. I know a lot of people are interested, Walker, in how you're doing right now. You had the flexor strain, and you have a bone chip that was removed from your elbow a couple weeks ago. And I read where he said it can be a little tricky because you don't know exactly 
what's on the other side of this recovery process. How confident are you a couple weeks in or so that you will be able to, to get back in late August, early September? Uh, yeah, that's the plan. You know, I've only had really one major injury since, like, you know, since I turned professional, and and that one went uh, supposed to be 12 months, and it took 367 days. So hopefully we uh, we have kind of a, a similar timeline, and and everything goes well. So you know, I'm about two weeks out today, so we'll uh, we'll see what happens. But you know, we're obviously you guys heard BMAC and and Brandon talking, and and kind of the resources that we have here, and. You know, I have no reason to believe I won't be back in, in early to mid-September. Walker, uh, we've all watched you grow as a pitcher, and right from the beginning when you were up here with 98 miles an hour and unbelievable stuff and everything that you have and you can bring to the game, but how have you grown mentally in the game as we've watched you develop? Because you're surely a different pitcher now than you were when you first got here. Yeah, I think your priorities change. I think at first you're just trying to be good and, and good enough to stay here, and, and then you want to be really good. And, and you know, we talked about the All-Star games and things like that. Your your priorities shift to to leading your team in innings or, or you know, things like that where you want to be valuable and be out there every day. And, um, you know, last year was a huge step for me in, in that regard and something that I'm really proud of was throwing 200 innings. And, you know, at first I, I just wanted to, to not give up runs and, and you kind of shift to trying to be valuable. And, and Clayton has been a, a great example of that for me. And, you know, he, he's dealt with his injuries, but when he's out there, he's going to give us six, seven, eight innings. And um, being able to watch him, I think, has been huge for me. Jaime and Fernando, both of you broadcast partners, you've called quite a few games that Walker Bueller has pitched. Fernando, I'll begin with you. When you see Walker throw, what goes through your mind? Well, uh, I'll tell you, well, when I was pitching, I, I wish I could have that fastball. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> no, I think it's uh, one of the best uh, uh, breaking pitch with the curveball. And, I, you know, I've been watching a few games, but I think that's Walker got the tremendous curveball. And um, I think he's, we ask him, uh, I ask him uh, why or what pitch put more pressure on his arm and he say well some this pitch and uh, say yeah correct and then and, <laughs> but and he doesn't agree with that one for but, um, but i think he's uh got good 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 stuff and uh i think he can be one of the winners in uh in the team i mean what stands out to you well, when, Walker when, he, the when he comes to the mound i i start thinking that he's going to pitch a no hitter his poise is fantastic, and uh, and his staff is unbelievable. So I always think positively, and I always think that he's going to do something very special tonight because he has the talent, the talent to do it. And uh, you know, he has been a great pitcher for the Dodgers so far. You guys all have watched a lot of baseball, and you have played a lot of baseball and announced a lot of baseball. What's your feeling when you walk into Dodger Stadium? Me? Confident. You've been oh. here the longest. You go first. <laughs> <laughs> What's your feeling, Jaime, when you walk into this stadium? What, when you see this place that you've worked at for so many years? Well, I consider this my, my second home. So this is my home. I have, sp I have spent so many days here in this place, and I love the stadium. I think it is the, in, uh, among the, the open stadiums, is the best, no question about it. So I feel great, and uh, I, I, when I take my break in the four or three innings, I go around uh, to see how is everything. And it gives me such a pleasure to see so many Latini, Latinos coming to the, to the, to the World Park. Because when I, when I started with the Dodgers, like in 59 at the Coliseum, the Latino fan base of the Dodgers was just starting. And the Latinos coming to the World Park was 8%, 8%. Now I understand it's between 42 and 46%. And at the beginning, all the Latinos used to come to that area and to the bleachers. Now they are everywhere. The most expensive seats, and there and there, and the largest, and everything. It's amazing. And that gives me a great pleasure because I think we have done our work. We have cultivated the Latino market. And I am so glad. One of the reasons why 
I feel so great with the Dajos is because I was very fortunate to come to an organization that realizes how powerful the Latino market is. And an organization that has done so much to help the, the community, giving back to the community. That's one of the three reasons. Let me tell you the three reasons why I have lasted so long with the Dajos, 64 years. The first one is I fell in love with, with the game. Considering the fact that before coming to this country in 1955, I have never seen a baseball game in my life. Never, never. Because in Quito, Ecuador, they don't play baseball. I came here and I watched the games. I started uh, working here. So <coughs> that's, the, that's the reason. Number, one. Number two, the, the support I have from my wife, my late wife. You know, she didn't care much about the game. But she used to come only to opening day here at the Dodgers Stadium. But she never, never complained about me being absent so much, traveling so much. Never complained. That was great. And third is the fact that the Dodgers really uh, give back to the community. That's many times also, you know, I have received, thank God, many, many recognitions, many accolades. But when I am going to the supermarket, to the post office, people stop me and say, Mr. Harin, let me thank you because thanks to you, I spend more time with my grandfather. Thanks to you, my father used to take by my hand. My, my, my mother was watching the novelas there, so he, we went outside to listen to you, to follow the dodges. And, uh, and then they said, my mother fell in love with the game thanks to your voice. So that really feels me a lot. That's the best compliment that I can get it. Well, <laughs> Fernando, they went from 8% Latinos to 42 to 46%. I think you were part of that too. What is it like bit. when you walk into Dodger Stadium, the feeling you get and the fans are greeting you? You know, when... Uh, when you go to the mound uh, and see the, a lot of people on stands, I think that's giving you more energy to, uh, to perform better. And, uh, and I think that's, that's the way when you uh, watch all the people, you know, in the stands. And really, when I was a uh, chance to uh, pitch in what year? 81 or 80? Uh, really, that was uh, more exciting, you know, because we played together in, uh, in, in Double A San Antonio, and how much people we have there? Two thousand? Two, three thousand, yeah. Okay. And coming <laughs> over here for 40,000 in those years, 35, yeah. it's a lot. But I think that's provoked all the uh, energy for well, it didn't make you It didn't make you nervous, it made you excited. Oh, yeah. Energy. Okay. Everybody got nervous, and I think that's someone's. Uh, they show some more, but I try to stay just just focus on the game, and that's it. Well, I have three really good hitting pitchers up here with me. Oral once won a silver slugger, and I see Walker Bueller. He's shaking his head, but Fernando hit ten home runs. I think you had a bunch of pinch hits. You hit about 380 as a pinch hitter in your career. And then Walker, you had an oppo home run. I mean, not even Jerry Hurston Jr. has ever hit an opposite field home run in his life. So I'm going to give you credit there. But do you like not being able to swing the bat anymore? And Fernando and Oral, what would you think if you had a universal DH when you guys play? But I'll begin with you, Walker. Do you miss going up there to the plate with a bat? I know they're going to disagree with me, but I, I love not hitting. I do miss... <laughs> uh, I do miss, miss facing the other pitcher um, but outside of that I'm I'm glad I don't have to do it anymore I have a bad run um, it's all been positive for me how much were you trying to go deep last year the last year of pitchers in no I got my one I think that's kind of stepped <laughs> out for me <laughs> how about for you Fernando would you have enjoyed not swinging the bat because you were so good with Fernando could have been an everyday player. If That's he what I thought too. He would could have been a Shohei Otani before Shohei Otani. He could have been an outfielder or a first baseman, for sure. You so you don't that. like the universal DH then for now? You would not have liked that. You know, well, I'm happy to um, to to pitch in uh, in, in my era because of not the age. Right. I think I love because 
this game has to go and uh, not only go and throw the ball from the from the mound. You has to go and and you do it. You you work and humble it too, because uh, sometimes when the game is so close, if uh, they should, uh, or they can see you, you're not allowed or or do some perfect bonds. They're gonna take you out of the game, right? And then they go, you uh, ND or you W, and and, and really you gotta pr uh, practice all those things. And oral before to stay you, in a game. Yeah, yeah we, oral, before you answer though, oral. Yeah. Before you answer, the greatest game of your life. He only allowed three hits to the Oakland A's game two of the World Series. He had three hits himself in that game. So I imagine you would not have liked the universal DH. No, I would not. Uh, Fernando and I talked about it when we were teammates. We talk about how to beat the opposing pitcher with our bat. So we worked very, very hard at our bunning. We worked very, very hard at not striking out. He worked hard at being able to hit the ball to the ballpark. I never hit a home run. I hit the top of the wall in Cincinnati once. See, so you got that on him, Walker. Yeah. Yeah, he's got, Walker's got that. I can't get one now. Fernando's got the triple crown, Cy Young, Gold Glove, and Silver Slugger. He's got the pitcher's triple crown. So does Zach Granke. And uh, Clayton Kershaw can't get it anymore, and we're kind of glad he can't join that club, Fernando. We're the only three that are ever going to do that. I want to ask a little bit of a different question, if I can, once again to uh, the pitchers who are here, because I work with a guy named Jerry Harrison Jr. I'm sure you all know. And if there's one thing, one person Jerry Harrison Jr. likes to talk about, it is Jerry Harrison Jr. And he talks a lot about certain pitchers that he says he raked against or owned, and they're usually Cy Young Award winners. And then sure enough, Barry Zito is doing a radio interview not that long ago, and, and I think it was Dan Patrick asked him, Who's one guy, kind of an under-the-radar guy, who you just couldn't get out? And he said, without a doubt, Jerry Hurston Jr. So I want to ask the three of you guys, is there one hitter, whether he's a big star or an under-the-radar guy, he's like, man, no matter what I throw up there, I can't get this guy out. So I'll begin with you, Walker. Um, that guy for me was always Garrett Hampson from Colorado, and it still is. Um, you know, they're playing him tonight, so I'm glad I'm not throwing, um, just so I don't have to face Garrett. But uh, for some reason or another, I, I can't get him out. Fernando, was there one guy? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, played for the for the Giants. Uh, Chris Spire. Wow, Chris e Spire. Everything. I throw this back to the middle. Kind of a light hitting. And shortstop, I tried to huh? pitch inside. I, I told him one time. I say, do you want to hit? I'm gonna pitch you inside so you can pull the ball because I don't want to. Get it back to me over here. It's dangerous, too close from the from the plate to the mound. But but I think uh, the other one was. Uh, but I think everybody had a problem with him with Tony Wynn. Yeah. Anything, anything you throw, it's a base hit. Throw it so down. So finally, the finally, I, throw, uh, I say, no, I'm gonna throw right in the middle. Right in the middle. Go ahead. Don't waste any pitches. <laughs> yeah, if you throw it away, he hits it in the shortstop hole, you flitch it in, he hits a double down the line, throw it down the middle, make him decide. <laughs> Was there a guy, Earl? Oh, there, there's a lot of guys. I mean, there's the guy that gets you mentally, and it's the guy that statistically, if you go to baseball reference and look at the highest average against you, the highest average is for a guy that I faced a lot was Craig Biggio. Uh, you know, I have an excuse, too, because you had to pitch him in, but he crowded the plate, and he had that armor on. So you got to pitch him in here, but he's got the armor on, and all he would do is just lean and either get hit. So I was like, where do you pitch the guy? And I'd go away, and he'd blister me in the gap. So I didn't like pitching to him. <laughs> What's I wish first base was open, let's say, when he comes up. That, that'd be all right. That'd hit that thing, and he could go stand it first. <laughs> Oral and uh, Fernando, how do you think Tommy would do, Tommy Lasorda would do as manager in today's game with pitch counts? Because both of you guys... <laughs> I mean, he would have you out there until your arm was about to fall off. And, and Walker finally threw his first shutout this year because of pitch counts, more or less. Walker was excited about going 200 innings. We would be there in August. <laughs> <laughs> I think the game three of the World Series in 1981, I don't know how many pitches you threw, Fernando. I don't even know if they kept track, but you walked, I don't know, six guys in that game. You threw a complete game, gave up some hits, I think five runs, and still finished that game all yourself. Was Tommy ever into pitch counts at all with you? Not Tommy, but the pitching coach, uh, Ron Peronowski. Mm. Oh, but Oral got away, had a way around that. 
And I'd always Brody, ask him. he did the same thing. You did, I you did. did it too. Because Fernando, I'd do it they for used Fernando, to, they and he'd counted. do it for me. They count. Well, they, uh, they had a reverse button on it? Uh, no, so it had the pitch click, zero, 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 the zero, clicker. Zero. Yeah. <laughs> Just zero it, it out. the clicker, and I would zero it out when he was out there and click it back up to about five less. And, and oh, here, Perry. Because we were doing, we'd have to chart. We'd have to manually chart back then and on, on the whole thing. So I would go, oh, Perry, I lost the count. Fernando, can I have the clicker? i got to fill out what we did. And I reset it for him. So he, he always threw about 10 or 15 more than was on that counter. <laughs> it was the w pitch count. Charlie. How many innings did you throw, Charlie, one year? 285. 285 innings. Oh, my gosh. And he pitched till he was 46. Yeah. Wow. Go figure. Unbelievable. You got another question for him, John? I'm dry. These are my friends. I see them every day. You're, you're done? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll follow through. I'll follow up for you. I'll do the professional thing. <laughs> I just wanted to get to know some of the guys because I was sitting here and I had these wild thoughts that go through my head and I sit here and I think, I wonder what Walker Buehler's first concert was that he ever saw. I was literally thinking that on the drive down here. I was like wondering what some of the guys' first concert was okay. because we had a conversation at Ned Coletti's house a couple weeks ago about this and we had some interesting answers. Do you have a good answer for your first concert? Yeah, unfortunately it was the Backstreet Boys. <laughs> <laughs> Is that as long as you love me? That's pretty good. That's pretty good. The first one. Uh, Oral, how about for you? First concert ever? Uh, I was at the Janet Elvis? Jackson concert the day that he threw his no-hitter. Oh, yeah, you should tell the story. You weren't so, even here. You were on the team, but you weren't I here. I was rehabbing my shoulder like Walker is rehabbing now, and it was driving me crazy to come to the ballpark, be with my teammates, and you feel like you're not part of the team. And Tommy could see that it was wearing on me, and he said, take a day off from not staying for the game and just... And I'm like, Fernando's pitching. He goes, yeah, we'll be fine. He's pitching. And I go, you're right. We'll be fine. So he let me go home early, and I went to the Janet Jackson concert. I come out of the concert and find out he's thrown the no-hitter. So the next day I got up, and I've got the L.A. Times, and he's the cover of the L.A. Times. And he's my buddy. So I went and got, bought six L.A. Times, had them all framed at the frame shop, and brought them in as a gift and said, sorry, buddy, I missed, I missed your no-hitter. <laughs> so... What was the I question, don't like John? Concerts. You don't like concerts, no. Fernando? No. So, don't waste your time. Okay. Hi, man. Question. You don't like concerts? Uh, many, many years ago, Julio Iglesias concert. That oh. was uh, really great. Yeah, it was really great. And we became good friends later on, and, and uh, I enjoyed that very much. Julio you know, everybody knows that Tommy Lasorda was my baseball dad. This is my baseball dad. Yeah. <laughs> this is my Latino baseball dad. <laughs> He is the, the ultimate gentleman. He teaches you how to be a big league big leaguer just by watching him operate and go about his business on a daily basis. Uh, taking road trips, the way he greets the bellman or the, the girl at the clerk or when you go to a restaurant or when a fan comes up to the table. Uh, this is the gentleman you learn from. Oh, thank you. Well, I have been very fortunate to be with the Dodgers for so long and to see in action the best of the best. I have seen... Mickey Mantle, Willie Mays, Roberto Clemente, Henry Adams, Stan Niger, you name it. The best of the best. And I also been among the best of the best great dancers. Big Skelly, uh, oh so many, so many. It's, 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 it's a privilege to me, has been so fortunate to be that. And also to have the, the, the backing of, of the audience because you know, in this business, if you don't have the numbers, you are, you are lost. And we have kept the numbers, numbers up, 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 and we have a great audience because of it. When I came to this country, I was thinking of going to New York because I was also trying to be a commercial pilot. And I already went to a, a, a school of aeronautics in, in New Jersey. But then I decided to forget about that and concentrate in, in, in radio. And I saw the demographics and I said, no, no, I should go to Los Angeles because of the Latinos here. And I was so lucky to make that decision. And I came to Los Angeles and the audience has been great and great to me. Everything that I have gained is thanks to them. Thanks to them. And I don't have enough words to, really to thank the, 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 the listeners. Before he came on, 
I was very well known, but only here in Southern California. But thanks to Fernando, because I was with him everywhere in 1981, they knew who Jaime Harring is in New York and St. Louis and in, in Atlanta, everywhere where they play Major League Baseball. And um, it has been great with me, and thank Fernando because of that. But probably one of the reasons why I am in the Hall of Fame is because of Fernando, because I was with him, and, and he was great held in those press conferences. Uh, he never refused to answer a question. The only advice that I gave Fernando was, Fernando, you don't have to answer every question that they ask you. If you don't like a question, just very politely, very diplomatic, said, I'm sorry, next question, please. Well, That's Jaime, the only thing that I gave him. Jaime, there were times when he would give like four word answers and you would talk for like <laughs> three minutes. <laughs> Sometimes were you opposite. covering for him? <laughs> you were covering for him. So I enjoyed that, that very much. Idea. That was the idea. Yeah. That was the idea. So. And we had a special in 1981. It was a tough, tough press conference in New York and in Atlanta. New York especially. Oh, my goodness. They were after Fernando. About 150 newspaper guys were there at the Shea Stadium. And they asked him all types of questions. They started asking him about the strike. He said, what's, what's that? We didn't know about the strike coming up. And so it was a great, great experience for me. Then going to the White House and to see the most powerful men of the, of the country, President Reagan, Vice President Bush, uh, Alexander Hayes, Secretary of State, Weinberger, Secretary of the Defense, mm -hmm. all, all of them in line waiting for this kid from Mexico, 19 years old, long hair, no English, asking for a, for a signature. That was, my goodness, that, that was unbelievable, unbelievable at the Hot Heist, 1981. And that's why I think Fernando should have his number retired and he should be in the Hall of Fame and not let Sports Writers of America determine who was impactful in the Dodgers organization. It's a great place to leave it. Jaime Hureen, Fernando Valenzuela, Walker Vila, thank you all for being with us tonight, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it very much.